recognize the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. King, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank all the witnesses for your testimony. And um, I would first um, remark uh, what goes through my mind when I hear the advocacy from the gentleman from New York about conscience protection. And uh, I would think that if it it's a position of anybody in this country that one would be compelled to carry out a marriage of same-sex couples if that violates your religious convictions, if it violates a sacrament of the church, for example, or if one's compelled as a pharmacist to distribute, um, distribute birth control and, uh, and against one's religious beliefs, if that's the position, and I'm hearing that position consistently in this, on this committee, then I would suggest that when you put the shoe on the other foot, if you have a prison warden whose job it is to carry out an execution, would the advocates for uh, the elimination of conscience protection also argue that that prison warden should be compelled to carry out the execution if it violated his conscience? And I would turn that question to Bishop Laurie. Yeah, I would, I would uh, agree with your observation, Congressman. It, it seems to me that uh, um, conscience protection has always been uh, a part of our way of life. Uh, the idea that um, one, because one works for the government, one has to check his conscience at the door, whether those are um, conscientious objections to abortion or to same-sex marriage or to capital punishment or even uh, uh, the service of the undocumented, it seems to me that, uh, that these things have always been broadly accommodated and they should continue to be broadly accommodated. That's one of the things that has made our country great. Um, to paint conscientious objections uh, to things like abortion or contraception or same-sex marriage as uh, sort of a, a, as, as discriminatory um, really flies in the face of what religious liberty is. It means the right to bring our convictions into the public square, a right to act upon them, uh, a right not to be compelled to do things which we consider to be inherently wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, anybody in a, in, a, in a repressive society can believe what he wants privately, but in a free society, you can bring your convictions out into public. Bishop, if, if an individual or a group of individuals actively engaged in or promoted the idea of desecrating the Eucharist, would that be a direct affront to the church? It would indeed, of the most serious nature. And of the sacraments of the church, would you name the seven sacraments first, please? Sure. Uh, just like my confirmation classes, baptism, <laughs> um, confirmation, um, uh, Eucharist, uh, penance, anointing of the sick, marriage, and, uh, and, and uh, holy orders. And you learned it as last rites and had to change that as you and, come along. Yes, and it, 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 it used sick. to be called extreme unction. It's called... Uh, <laughs> Even uh, further back. I just I wanted to make that point that when there's an active effort to desecrate a sacrament of the church, that is a direct insult and affront to the, to the Catholic Church. Absolutely. And marriage, of course, clearly is one of the seven sacraments yep. fitting in the Marriage is recognized as a sacrament. Uh, first of all, it was recognized as something uh, of a natural relationship, um, sort of uh, inscribed uh, in our nature by the Creator, that has served the common good and is a pillar of civilization. It's a unique relationship of a man and woman. The church has also recognized it as a sacrament because it, the love of husband and wife expressed the love of Christ for the church. Let's explore another principle, and, uh, and, and that is, as, as I'm hearing this blurred uh, approach to uh, the implication that uh, the civil rights uh, extend to same-sex marriage, for example, and I'd like to explore a little bit the concept of immutable characteristics that were the foundation of the uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. That, that, and that this, these are the items, protection for race, color, religion, sex, national origin, R religion being the only one of those in the list that's specifically constitutionally protected. 
the balance of them are immutable characteristics that can be independently identified and cannot be willfully changed. When we go beyond the definition of immutable characteristics, then could you talk to us a little bit about what that does to this concept of uh, civil rights and equal protection? Well, sure. I, it seems to me that um, f when you take an institution such as marriage and you redefine it uh, arbitrarily, uh, then um, you are taking something that uh, is not only long established, but unique and for the common good of society, and you are um, sort of cutting it loose from its moorings. Um, marriage is not simply, um, that, it's not as if you could make one change and that is it. The state, um, the, the, the notion of what marriage is appears throughout federal law, it appears in state law, it appears in regulations, it affects how church and state relate uh, in uh, a broad variety of ways and by arbitrarily redefining it, uh, you're setting up, um, you're queuing up church-state conflict for years to come uh, because it is, marriage is so broadly referred to throughout American law. Thank you, Bishop. I thank all the witnesses. I regret I wasn't able to ask questions of the balance of the panel, and I yield back.